and welcome to Lessons in Logic, video number 57. We're almost finished, and uh, we might yet hit 60, but at any rate, we've hit upper 50s, and I'm using another picture of Hong Kong's magnificent lion rock for the lower right-hand corner of the screen, and I have to attribute this picture again to NHK9, a lion rock at sunset picture. Uh, Kowloon's off to the left, Shantin Valley off to the right, and... Lion Rock is awesome, and that's all I have to say about that. Let's talk about inferences to the best explanation. Now, I don't have a lot of pre-prepared notes, so I don't have a lot to say about this. Let's start with clarifying some terms, though. This could be terribly important. A lot of times you'll study things and just be left with ridiculous communication problems because people use terms in different ways. I don't fully understand why, except it's how language works. Terms evolve. Sometimes they devolve. All right, so the word induction is sometimes used specifically to refer to an I to A inference on the traditional square of opposition, which is not bad. It's bad deductive reasoning, but it's not bad inductive reasoning. But specifically, the word induction is sometimes used to refer to generalizing reason. And generalizing reasoning, going from particular instances to universal claims, like all the observed swans are white, therefore all swans are white, which was a good inference in its time, but was later found to be mistaken, because this is fallible, if not good, bad, it's at least fallible reasoning, good but fallible reasoning. All objects, um, when unencumbered and are near enough to the center of, well, all objects much smaller than Earth and near the Earth will move towards the center of the Earth unless they're obstructed. I guess you can say something about they're not being um, the sun not moving too close to Earth to pull them in the opposite direction or something like that. In the current astronomical arrangements, all objects that are unencumbered and are much smaller than the Earth will move towards the center of the Earth, unless otherwise obstructing or something like that. Some such principle as that is a generalization based off of observing nothing like all falling objects. There are literally trillions of raindrops we've never observed, but um, we've seen enough that we can make an observation, a generalized observation. We've seen enough that we can make a generalized statement from our observations that all falling objects behave in this manner, consistent with the laws of gravity and inertia, etc. It is possible to do generalizations. That generalization is not bad reasoning. It tends to be, it is fallible, but it's not bad reasoning as such. Anyway, sometimes that generalization is referred to as inducting or induction. And deduction is sometimes referred to as going from general to specific. So, um, Valid inferences on the traditional square value position from A to I. All guinea pigs are mammals. Squeaky is a guinea pig, therefore squeaky is a mammal. This is not the correct way to use the terms these days, or at least it's not the way you use them in logic textbooks these days. I don't really care how you use the terms. Just know that the standard terminology in logic textbooks is different. Deduction means reasoning that's deductive in that we're trying to give premises that guarantee the conclusion such that the premises cannot be true and the conclusion falls at the same time. Induction means we're just trying to give probabilistic reasoning. That generalization reasoning, all observed cows or mammals, therefore all cows or mammals, all mammals have, all observed mammals have hair, therefore all mammals have hair. All observed whales have lungs, therefore all whales have lungs or whatever. This generalized re this generalization reasoning is not induction as such. It's a type of induction. Inductive reasoning just means probabilistic reasoning. This is just one of the kinds of probabilistic reasoning. That's how the logic textbooks normally use the term. And you may occasionally see some older terminology where induction is used in that other way. Let's um, now introduce abduction, a term I rarely use, but never use. Uh, we're not referring to being abducted as by aliens or, or jerks. Merriam-Webster provides us a simple def a simple introduction to uh, these three terms as they have sometimes been used. Deductive reasoning is making an inference based on widely accepted facts or premises. 
uh, beverage drinkable through a straw deduction determined soup to be a beverage. This is um, deductive reasoning. That's actually fairly, that's actually what I was just describing, the deductive reasoning as opposed to inductive reasoning according to the terminology not used in logic textbooks these days, the alternative terminology. Inductive reasoning is making an inference based on an observation, often of a sample. Make a generalization based on some observations. Or induce that soup is good by observing all your friends consuming it. This is not quite the logic textbook definition. It's not defining all probabilistic reasoning as inductive. But it's not quite the older definition I was looking at either, because the terms are confusing. But anyway, this the description of abduction is what I really wanted to go, to go for, go here for. Abduction is making a probable conclusion from what you know. Example, see an abandoned bowl of hot soup on the table. You can use abduction to conclude the owner of the soup is likely returning soon. So that is an inference to the best explanation and similar reasoning. That's why we're talking about this now. Now, I'm, I'm not going to correctly oversimplify things. So I'm going to incorrectly oversimplify things by saying using terminology the way I strongly recommend it, consistently with logic textbook terminology these days, deduction means reasoning where we're trying to give premises that guarantee the conclusion. Induction means reasoning where we're giving probabilistic arguments. Abduction is a particular type of induction where we're doing inferences to the best explanation. Now, what was imprecise about that is not everything called abduction is strictly speaking an inference to the best explanation, but close enough. Also, I'm never going to use the term again in all likelihood. I don't need this term. I don't want to use it. I'm happy just talking about inferences to the best explanation. I need these two terms, deduction, induction, because they're the, the heart and soul of the basic distinction in logic, or they, they follow on the heart and soul of the basic distinction in logic, the distinction between trying to guarantee your conclusion given the premises and trying to give basic probabilistic reasoning. Deduction and induction, but sometimes the terms are used differently, in particular induction as a particular kind of using logic textbook terminology, inductive reasoning, namely generalizations, and abduction as inference to the best explanation. But let's get rid of this text. Let's talk about inferences to the best explanation. I have very little to say about this. Uh, I don't have a lot of detailed notes. I don't remember reading about this in a textbook. I'm just trying to give some basic guidance. When you're giving an inference to the best explanation, you're explaining a phenomenon with a theory, a phenomenon with a theory. You're explaining an event or some observations with a theory. The theory is an explanation, and it's explaining the things that need to be explained. I think you might be able to give some Latin participle terms here. Explanons for the thing doing the explaining, and explanandum for the thing to be explained. Or if there's multiple things, explananda for things to be explained. But never, never mind the Latin. And there's the explanation, and there's the phenomenon, or the phenomena, or the events to be explained, the observations to be explained. And I think there's basically just two rules you need to work with. The explanation should succeed in explaining the thing it's supposed to explain. The explanation should not be more complex than it needs to be to get the explaining done. Now, ideally, an explanation would not have any competing explanations that are as good as it or better than it. And ideally, an explanation would be consistent with what we already know. But I think these rules can be explained. These preferences here can be explained in terms of just these rules. These rules, I think, are all we really need to say what makes a good explanation. Don't quote me on this. Take this as a rudimentary model for analyzing inferences to the best explanation. Use it until you find a better model. So should I give some examples? Maybe. Let me first see if I need to explain why I think these two preferences can be reduced to these two rules. An explanation should not have any competing explanations that are as good as it or better than it. And I think what makes another one good is just going to be these two rules. So this is a useful thought. An explanation should not have any competing explanations that are as good as or better than it. But here we're just describing what would make it good as, as good as or better. What makes an explanation good? Just these things. Ideally, an explanation would be consistent with what we already know. Well, I think if it's not consistent with what we already know, then that's one particular type of complexity. 
there are at least two types of complexity an explanation might have. It might involve multiple things of the same kind that we already know, or new things we don't already know about. So example, I come home, I find a terrible mess in the living room. It's perfectly consistent with what we already know to say the kids did it. It's not consistent with what we already know to say, oh my gosh, aliens have been in my house and they left a mess in the living room. I don't know that aliens exist. I don't know that they've been in my house. So that's not a great explanation, but that's a particular kind of complexity. It's more complex to say every one of the kids did that than it is to say one or two of them probably did this. The explanation doesn't need to be more complex than it needs to be to get the explaining done. Minimum of one kid left the mess. Well, maybe to properly explain it, depending on the style and the extent of the mess, I might need to posit two or three kids. It might need to be complex to some level. But anyway, the point is adding extra kids to the explanation, it was all of them versus it was just one or two of them, is one kind of complexity. And another kind of complexity is adding whole other things like it was the aliens or it was the aliens and the kids working together. The kids have been working with aliens all this time. Oh my gosh. It's not a good explanation. It's needlessly complex. So these, I think, are the basic two rules for good explanation. And that's a good example. I come home, I find a terrible mess. Kids made the mess. Totally explains the mess. The mess is not more complex than it needs to be to get the explanation done totally fits with um, pre-existing knowledge. It's perfect. Now, inferences to the best explanation are fallible. I might be able to, if I had time and motivation, neither of which I have, come up with an example of a valid inference to the best explanation, but I don't want to. As a rule, inferences to the best explanation are probabilistic reasoning. And I think these two questions would be the first things you would do to evaluate an inference to the best explanation. Does it sufficiently explain what it needs to explain? And is it more complex than is necessary? I think that's most of what you need to know. Um, I wonder if I should give any other examples. I don't think I will. I think that example is sufficient to illustrate the point about this particular uh, pattern of reasoning. Things are gonna get more complex with, um, for example, economic. Economic analyses, what caused the current inflation. Um, maybe several things contributed. Our explanation should not be more complex than necessary, but it should be able to explain what it's supposed to explain. And we might have to say two or three or maybe four things contributed to the current inflation uh, in order to properly explain it. We might not be able to explain it with just one thing. Now, that, that doesn't mean necessarily that there's always a balancing act between these two priorities. But it does mean sometimes there might be a balancing act. So get it right. Try to do both. Um, I guess that's all. See you next time.